Okay. Um, I just wanted to say hi to everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your week to be here with us today. I'm really excited about the lineup of speakers that we have to, to hear from coming up. And I'm going to pass it off to Dominic, who will introduce our keynote. <laughs> Transmitted directly on YouTube. Um, so if, if you want your voice heard, you can speak through the microphone. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Jason Kavanaugh. So I will introduce uh, Jason. You hear me? Yeah, okay. So Jason Camelot is Professor of English and Research Chair in Literature and Sound Studies at Concordia University in Montreal. His recent critical works include Photo Phonopoetics, The Making of Early Literary Recordings, Stanford, 2019, and co-edited collections, Collection Thinking Within and Without Libraries, Archives, and Museums with Martha Langford and Linda Mora, Rutledge, 2023. Unpacking the Personal Library, The Public and Private Life of Books with Jeffrey Weingarten, Wilfrid Laurier University Press, 2022. Can Lit Across Media, Unarchi Unarchiving the Literary Event with Catherine McLeod and McGill Queens, University Press, 2019. Most recently, he has co-edited with Catherine McLeod a soon forthcoming special double issue of English Studies in Canada on new sonic approaches in literary studies. You'll find his article uh, co-authored with uh, Andrea Murray and Darren Wurschler on the afterlife of performance in that collection. Uh, Jason is also the author of five collections of poetry, most recently Vlarf, McGill Queens University Press, 2021. He is principal investigator and director of the Shirk-funded Spoken Web Research Partnership that focuses on the history of literary sound recordings and the digital preservation and presentation of collections of literary audio. And, the, and his talk today is Event and Entity, Ongoing Thoughts on the Afterlife of Performance. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, and um, thank you so much to Dominic and Rebecca for just facilitating um, my appearance here. It's really, a, it's really a, an honor to be here and to participate in this grad conference, and congratulations on um, the program that you put together. It's a, it's a big achievement. So I was just going to say a word about, sorry, I have to see if this works here. I was just going to say a word about Spoken Web. So Spoken Web is um, an international research partnership that focuses on, <sighs> collaborates on finding, um, digitizing for the purposes of preservation, and making accessible for research and teaching collections of usually documentary sound recordings uh, that document literary activities that have taken place in Canada, but not necessarily of Canadians. Um, since the 1950s. So it's a big kind of project that is uh, building up a corpus of materials that have, for the most part, been <clears throat> left in boxes. Even if they're at institutional archives, they haven't been digitized. They've remained relatively useless. And because of the media formats that they've been recorded on, <clears throat> they, um, they're in peril now because uh, reel-to-reel -reel tapes that were made in the 50s or 60s um, decay and they actually they suffer from something called sticky shed syndrome it sounds really bad it's like um and uh essentially the, so a lot of these artifacts will no longer be playable or usable at all in about a decade's time and so that's one of the impetuses of that project um, but um, as we digitize them 
and describe them, which is very important. Uh, we're making these materials less and less useless, right, uh, for research and teaching. And also, at the same time, sort of thinking about the implications of, in, of doing literary history through sound rather than through what we're used to doing, which is engaging with materials on the printed page. So it's kind of an intervention a little bit methodologically in the discipline itself. So what does it mean to study literature through another medium, through a time-based medium, uh, and through sound in particular? Um, so uh, my talk today is, uh, as Dominic mentioned, coming out of a, a, <clears throat> a paper that I, an article that I co-wrote with my colleagues Darren Wurschler uh, at uh, Concordia University and Annie Murray, who's a librarian or an archivist at the University of Calgary called The Afterlife of Performance. Um, but this is a little bit of a, a riff on some of, the, uh, some of the writing that we did for that, that article, which will, which will come out in English Studies in Canada in the spring. It's already in the proofs stage, so it should be out fairly soon. Um, I'm going to jump right into it now. So the title is Event and Entity, Ongoing Thoughts on the Afterlife of Performance. <clears throat> so I think I got the title wrong on this. I have all these things that continue to pop up here. So let me just do something for a second. Sorry, you can see my desktop. It's always very embarrassing. Um, but, oh, it's too small for me, actually. I'm going to do something very risky. But it'll make it possible for me to continue. Entities exist, events occur. So there's the first description, <laughs> first set of definitions. What is the significance of this distinction for the study of documented literary performance? Such as sound record, a sound recording of a poetry reading event. So I don't intend to answer this question in any direct or extended way today. Rather, I'm gonna talk about the implications of this presupposition of those two definitions for the methods that we use to study such an artifact. So where both event and entity have long philosophical traditions connected with them, I introduce these terms only as a chalky starting line for a longer exploration of what I'm gonna call the afterlife of performance. Neither event nor entity is a definitive concept. Events suggest liveness and presence and discernible distinctive action <clears throat> in relation to a normative environment. Entity suggests something static, stable, discernible, and perhaps distinctive as the anchor for considering relations to other entities. <clears throat> the main context for these terms relevant to the talk that I'm going to give is that of the archival collection of documentary sound recordings of literary events. So I'm thinking of event and entity in that specific context. The event is the poetry reading that happened in place and time. The sound recording is the media capture of that event, which may in turn become an entity in a completely different media format within an archival structure that organizes a collection of sound recordings in relation to other like and unlike entities. Just what the entity of the event is may be challenging to define and requires some interpretive decisions that take place in the present. Is the entity the reel-to-reel -reel tape, the artifact? Is it the digitized signal of the content of that tape, or what we sometimes call the digital asset? Is it some section of that signal that better maps to our understanding of the contours of the original event? For example, if a single tape contains recordings of multiple events right, that uh, happened at different times and places. So you begin to see how the entity and the event are strongly determined by the conditions of its afterlife in the world uh, and by the motives of the agents who may care about it. Okay, so now I'm going to begin um, in earnest here. The afterlife of performance is riddled with assumptions about life, death, and time. One major assumption is the possibility of distinction between liveness and something else. 
In my talk today, I'm not really interested in how particular instantiations of liveness or presence are distinguished or produced in the ways that theorists like Philip Auslander and Hans Ehrlich, Ehrlich, <laughs> Ehrlich, Ehrlich Gumbrecht explore in their respective problems. Um, rather, I'm concerned with the particulars of how the afterlife of performance is produced, managed, and maintained by the application of various cultural techniques. In Bernard Siegert's sense of that term, cultural techniques incite, quote, a more or less complex actor network that comprises technological objects as well as the operative chains they are part of and that configure and constitute them. They are configured and constituted largely through the technique of discerning interpretive distinctions that work to comprise assertions of truth or the nature of the real. So um, that's Bernard Siegert. Here's a longer uh, definition of this point in particular. He interestingly observes that these distinctions that are used to constitute the real, right, uh, and that, that he defines as at the core of this cultural technique, uh, are recursive and may create new distinctions out of the single element of another distinction. So, for example, the distinction beautiful, ugly, right, that's one distinction that we may make, um, may be applied to the noise side of the signal noise binary and produce new distinctions between, say, beautiful noise and ugly noise, depending on the, the purpose of that noise. So today I want to consider how a network of particular people using particular hardware to capture a performance in a particular space on particular kinds of storage media combines with specific techniques such as mastering, editing, filing, labeling, holding, uh, holding, which sometimes meant long periods of neglecting, digitizing, remastering, and circulating in order to produce our sense of the relative worth of a recording of another group of particular people who were chanting and talking and reading. What we can see in this assemblage, if we examine it closely, is the inner workings of an, a mechanism that produces literary value. So partly what I'm talking about is how literary value around a particular kind of artifact is produced. It's very, my talk is very explicitly about how entities discerned for the production of memory are realized through cultural techniques that engage with and work to manage manifestations of mediated temporality and transmission. So it just seemed like perfectly in a tune with your, your theme of your conference. The afterlife of performance begins with an understanding of the infrastructure that supports its birth and lives on in our critical accounts of its circulation. So our particular object of study today is a recording of Allen Ginsberg performing in 1969 as part of the Poetry Four series at Sir George Williams University in Montreal. This specific 1969-1970 subseries of the decade-long reading series called simply the Poetry Series was mostly organized by poet George Bowering. Ginsburg was the third reader in that series, uh, that, uh, that year of the series, that included Jerome Rothenberg, Bill Bissett, Milton Kessler, Gladys Heinmart, Stan Persky, Diane Wachowski, Frank Davey, Robert Hoag, Ron Lowenson, David Ball, Tom Raworth, Al Purdy, and Joel Oppenheimer. Now, a digitized version of this recording of Ginsburg's reading event is available as part of the Spoken Web Project. I'm just going to play you a, a little clip from this. Okay. Oops. should be playing a clip from this. Let me try to escape this for a second. Sorry, I'm going to do this one more time.
for some reason. The sound was working before, but it isn't now. Let me describe the sounds here. <laughs> So this is what metadata is for, right? Uh, sometimes, actually, you don't have the rights to play a sound because you need to get permissions to do so. But what I was going to play for you, and maybe at some point we'll figure out how to do that, um, is an opening of chanting, right? There's chanting and symbols, OK? And on this recording, there's about 15 minutes of that. And it's uh, voices chanting Hare Krishna. This is a poetry reading, but this is how the poetry reading begins. And then I was going to skip ahead to different parts of the reading, and you would hear Allen Ginsberg um, reading certain poems like Angkor Wat and other long poems that he was um, you know, uh, interested in reading at that time, political poems. And then the second uh, set of this reading, this very long reading, over two hours long, um, is Allen Ginsberg with a harmonium uh, performing and singing uh, the songs of William Blake from Songs of Innocence and Experience, which he did a lot uh, around this time in the early 1970s. Okay, so um, I'll just try one more time. No, it's not working. Sorry about this. Trying to get back to my slides here. Everything's so small that it's impossible to see. Yeah, it's just not playing. It's okay. I'm going to... Um... Yeah, I did. That's okay. Sorry. I'm trying to... Which is the one that will get it? the slide back open? Okay. Perfect. That's okay. That's okay. We won't play the sound. It's okay. I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, so there's the sounds. <laughs> Those are the sounds uh, that I wanted you to hear for a second. All right, 17 more minutes of that, you can imagine, okay? Um, so this recording was never really designed to circulate as a final product. It was a, it's a documentary uh, recording. Um, I'm going to describe it as a material trace of a performance. It provides a sense that something has taken place, probably something important, but it is not a finished object in the way that even a live album might be a finished object. An entity like this is always somewhat partial and may incite numerous actions, explanatory frames, supporting infrastructures, research projects, stories, arguments, etc., to try to supplement its incompleteness, its status as a mere trace of something that happened once. The status of this object is never very clear, and our collective sense of it can and does change as the recording circulates. 
The Ginsburg recording is an excellent example of how close reading methodology can fail when confronted with the afterlife of performance. Infamously, as you heard, Ginsburg brought members of the Montreal Hare Krishna sect to the performance with him, and they chanted for an indeterminate amount of time before Ginsburg began to read and sing himself. Rather than an instrumental communication act that strives to convey some vital piece of information, chant itself is a form of what James Carey would call ritual communication. From a ritual perspective, communication is linked to terms such as sharing, participation, association, fellowship, and the possession of a common faith. A ritual view of communication is directed not toward the extension of messages in space, but toward the maintenance of society in time. Not the act of imparting information, but the representation of shared beliefs. Through the creation of a specific type of temporal experience, ritual communication builds a sense of belonging, and the exchange that occurs is affective rather than semantic. It's impossible to record the significance of ritual communication like chanting, because the significance of the communicative act is not the content, but in the participation at a specific time and place by a particular group of people. The reciprocal ritual action of taping poetry readings, will anyone ever listen to this that I'm recording, is equally difficult to pin down. As a result, the transcript of the text continually gestures elsewhere for its sense of meaning. So this is interesting because acts of memorializing events very often focus on content that signifies with memorable meaning. A saying, a last word, a statement that summarizes in synecdoche a larger event of which only a semantic trace remains. In my research on the earliest spoken recordings ever made in the 1890s, um, uh, Thomas Edison had agents out there collecting uh, short speeches by famous people. And essentially, they were used uh, as sort of synecdoches for who that was. A famous one is a Florence Nightingale saying how, you know, when I am you know, only a memory, of course she quite literally says that, you know, uh, no, uh, no longer a person. I hope my voice will, you know, in a sense, allow me to persist in this world and in people's memory for a, for a longer time. Um, Carrie's concept of ritual communication and the argument that I'm developing from it suggests that we have to look elsewhere than in semantic content alone for the trace of event in this performance, this Ginsburg performance. Along with theories of cultural technique and ritual communication, I'm also interested in the circulation of cultural forms. Part of the argument here, and these are mostly sort of methodological arguments, right, is that scholars need to pay more careful attention to circulation in general. We th you know, I think academics uh, are pretty good at talking about production and consumption. We talk about reception. Um, but less adept at describing what comes in between. It's not sort of like the, the common thing that we in literary studies especially sort of talk about. As this Ginsburg recording has moved through culture, it has been transfigured in a number of ways. The reel-to-reel -reel magnetic tape itself had been edited for a variety of reasons, some apparently arbitrary. You can see the white leader tape in this reel. This is the tape that that sound came from. So if you see those white lines, those are pieces of leader tape, right, uh, where cuts have been made and joined together by this additional tape. So the, the recording of the event was already acted upon very early in its life, right? Uh, and of course, the recording has since been digitized and placed online in a networked digital milieu. All of these transfigurations occurred and continue to occur within models of data description and management that are based on established practices of institutional libraries and archives. So in the case of the Sir George Williams University recordings, one of the key justifications for making recordings of literary events in the first place was to create content that could be circulated through the central institutional technology unit, the language laboratories and structural media unit, and in duplicate copies in the library's non-print media unit at Sir George Williams. 
I'm just going to show you know, a slide of this particular office at that time. The tape machines were there to capture content. So this is sort of a, an explanation as to why this recording even exists, right? And the library was there to make those recording events accessible for teaching or other uses. Now, there's very little evidence that the reel-to-reel -reel tapes were ever used um, um, after they were made. Uh, for these purposes, or they weren't used very much. But the material production of these event tapes found some of their first forms of institutional justification in the unit stamps, call numbers, and other metadata that the recordists and librarians applied to them, operations which made them, at least in principle, findable and circulable. So here are just some examples of what the tape boxes looked like. And if you read the tape boxes, so I'm not reading the events here, I'm reading these boxes, and these boxes are legible for institutional and archival um, structures that suggest that this has meaning and use and significance, right? Um, so the, it marks them with the offices that are in charge of them and with specific numbers um, that make them locatable and findable, assuming that they would want and need to be found. Situating the, material, uh, situating the material production and circulation of technological objects like the Sir George Williams Poetry Series tapes within disciplinary history and institutional imperatives, as well as cultural policy formation, allow us to recount a kind of meta-history of the event through attention to the material manifestations of afterlife. So there are a lot of questions that arise when conducting a meta-history of the event. I'm just going to sort of put some of them up here. I'm not going to read, read them all, um, but just to give you a sense of what this approach to thinking about the afterlife of performance, uh, what kinds of research questions arise. What does the specific materiality and circulatory history of these tapes tell us about, the changing, about changing scholarly priorities? What kinds of institutional actors leave a trace on the object? And what can we glean about their priorities from their interventions? What kinds of operations do English literary scholars habitually perform? What kinds of techniques are they expected to know? And are they at all useful when confronting an object like a reel-to-reel -reel poetry recording, etc.? The content in which the Sir George Williams University Ginsburg recording appears, that is, an online collection of digitized recordings within an academic digital humanities project, requires us to think about more than the author function. It requires thinking about methods like artifacts, such as other Ginsburg recordings in other university collections, or the new collection of digitized Ginsburg cassettes that are now online. Uh, and if you're interested in Allen Ginsberg, this is a kind of treasure trove of material. Because Ginsburg, you may know, in his, his in sort of uh, later career, was composing a lot by recording directly into uh, tape machines and then transcribing them afterwards. So I'm not going to go into great detail about historical context surrounding the Sir George Williams poetry series itself, because I've written about it elsewhere. But um, here's a brief summary. Um, and if you, if you want to find more information, here are some of the articles that you can look at. Um, the series was established by members of a self-named poetry committee consisting of English department and fine arts faculty members at a time before the Canada Council had an established program for funding poetry reading events. Uh, Cameron, Cameron Anstey has shown that the series benefited from the Canada Council's new interest in experimenting with funding such events, and they received money for their proposals between 1965 and 1974 through the already established Opera, Ballet, and Other Grants Program. So that's how they got their money to put these events on. One of the primary arguments that the Poetry Committee used to secure federal funding for its events was framed in terms of the discourse of cultural legitimation and maturity. According to this logic, by 1965, Canadian poetry had matured enough to appear on stage alongside American and British poetry read by American and British poets. Accordingly, this poetry series program regularly consisted of American and Canadian poets appearing either in alternating succession through the year or sometimes as a comparative double bill on the same night. The Faculty of Arts at Sir George Williams University also supported the program and its arguments for the importance of having Canadian poets read alongside poets from abroad. So there may not have been anything more Canadian in Montreal in 1969 than to have a famous American poet 
read in a Canadian university space. Some of you who've been to Montreal downtown will recognize this building. This was that space. Each and every one of these poetry events was recorded by the Instructional Media Office at Sir George Williams University. Caught up in the whirlwind of increasing public and institutional interest in media technology, progressive cultural policy and the flowering of media art practice that Michael Sentry describes as characteristic of Canadian culture from the mid-1960s to the 1990s, Sir George Williams University had recently poured a significant amount of money into the construction and wiring of a new state-of-the-art Henry Hall building, whose ribbon was cut in October 1966 on the same day that Montreal inaugurated its first metro lines. Classrooms in the hall building were fitted with closed circuit televisions and many lecture halls and classrooms were wired for the recording and transmission of audio and video from the Central Media Technology Unit. The, building, the built space of the new Brutalist Hall building and the new media vision of pedagogy that it housed and supported were the first among many subsequent material and institutional structures that gave shape to the afterlife of Ginsburg's 1969 Sir George Williams University performance. Vision is key here because we're talking as much about the institutional imaginary, this university's desire in the 60s to be seen as uh, being on the technological cutting edge, as we are about empirical fact. The imperative to put money into audiovisual equipment in the university in the 60s was part of a larger cultural moment, for sure. But it created an interesting problem in that the university then needed something to point all that equipment towards um, for AV capture, regardless of anyone, of whether anyone would ever look at that content again. Interviews with the recordists and technicians that we've, we've done who were hired at the time indicate that the equipment often didn't even work. Right? So this is just a quote from, <laughs> from an interview with um, Mark Schofield who was uh, on the job during uh, recording that Ginsburg event when it was happening, and who was involved in sort of technologizing the hall building at the time. Despite the gap between aspiration and actuality, the recordings were made and housed in the instructional media office, and later some were duplicated on open reel tape and housed in the library. At some point, these tapes, a mixture of originals and duplicates, were deaccessioned and given back to the Department of English. Decades later, they were deposited in the university archives, where they were given a new set of ID numbers and sat for another decade or so until they were first approached as research objects by me. Um, so what followed was a series of increasingly collaborative experiments exploring ways to engage with the recordings and the writing of grant applications designed to scale up the endeavor and expand the range of the methods we use, uh, we might use to process, describe, curate, analyze, and teach with digitized collections of recordings that documented literary events from the 1960s to the present. The first goal, uh, as I've already sort of mentioned, was to make the collection of this poetry series recordings less useless than they had, ha than they had been as reel-to-reel -reel tapes in the university archives. And to do this, we began to develop what I later learned was called metadata uh, about this audiovisual data. Metadata is basically data about data. The continuum between raw data and metadata was fluid, uh, as was the relationship between our critical concerns in analysis and curation. It was and continues to be productively difficult to draw the line between such categories, uh, in the broadest sense between research about collections and collections development. So in Spoken Web Team, we have a lot of archivists and librarians, and we have a lot of literature scholars, and we're all, in a sense, working um, on the same problems, but from different disciplinary perspectives. Um, so this continuum exists because our research and historical concerns are not exclusively content-based. Um, because our approach to our artifacts and collections have aimed to accommodate, if not always merge, a wide range of disciplinary interests. And because the institutions, universities and funding agencies that have supported our work have come to identify cultural value and methodological innovation in the humanities with large-scale collaboration and wide-ranging interdisciplinarity. So I'm getting really meta here, but I'm sort of reflecting on sort of what structures allow this kind of research to even happen. Um, this initial phase in the afterlife 
of Ginsburg's Sir George Williams University performance entailed acts of migrating across media formats, listening to, describing, and situating sounds that held a trace of the event, and organizing those descriptions, filled with content identifiable as relevant to a field like literary studies, such as names of authors, readers, and literary works read and mentioned, in a way that made them more useful than they had been before they were digitized described and contextualized for something that might be recognizable as literary research. One might think of this phase as one of structuring uh, data for possible use in circulation or, in a word, management. So I'm going to be talking about management now for the next couple of minutes. You know. The present occasion of research and digital development originates in the recording event, right? Allen Ginsberg chanted and read into a microphone in the late 1960s. That performance was transduced uh, into electrical pulses via the condenser microphone that, that was captured and was captured as patterns of iron oxide on band of tape. Those tape recorded signals sat on the shelves of institutional offices for a few decades, were converted into a form of audible digital data, and consequently required some form of networked management. If the recording event is the instant in which performance moves from life to afterlife, management is a condition of the afterlife of performance. Management is a condition of temporality, memory, and transmission. It's really uh, one of the major contexts for those things. The equipment, electrical signals, and spooling tape capturing traces of those signals are a mechanical process of afterlife preservation taking place as the live event unfolds. The event of the recording recedes as a focus of research output, while at the same time the demand for project descriptions, process documents and white papers about rights management, research data management, preservation management, digital asset management, project management, budget management, space management, the management of highly qualified personnel, etc. grows. So this one tape, as soon as we move it into this domain, basically uh, sets off all kinds of managerial activities. Once the recordings had been assigned an initial order and structure, they require new kinds of management as data, including the management of file naming for sharing and use in research and teaching, management to ensure their ongoing preservation, the management of a server to host the files. But beyond the material management, of data in particular locations at particular times, there are also policy questions pertaining to the management of rights and permissions that ensure their accessibility, circulation, and use in different contexts. The question of intellectual and legal ownership of the recording complicates the pragmatic considerations surrounding recorded poetry performance. In the Canadian copyright context, the rights holder of a recording is the individual or the organization that made or fixed the performance event. Um, therefore, the poet who makes their own recordings is the rights holder uh, uh, for that recorded manifestation of their work. If we consider a draft poem written on the comparatively solid medium of paper in Ginsburg's hand, on Ginsburg's paper, signed by Ginsburg, it's clear who authored this handwritten manifestation of the poem, and it's clear that the paper will last a relatively long time, provided it's not highly acidic or kept in poor archival housing or environmental conditions. But when a poet appears in a venue like Sir George Williams University and this poetry series, and is recorded by an individual from the university, the university is the rights holder for that instantiation of the poetry. Consequently, recordings, because of their opaqueness as readable and ownable and shareable technological and, and legal entities, are often fraught to administer, preserve, and circulate, requiring a correspondingly greater number of knowledgeable team workers to manage. One of the reasons I think that these tapes just sat in archives for so long is that they're too difficult to do anything with. <laughs> they're really, it requires a lot of... Um, uh, expertise and uh, human labor. Um, so what I'm outlining here is not a new process. Um, in Discourse Networks, uh, Friedrich Kittler describes in exhaustive detail how the author function of the Romantic poet ceded its exalted status and privilege to office workers during the age of electro-mechanical uh, media at the close of the 19th century. And Walter Benjamin noted something similar in, in the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility. 
Uh, after electromechanical media became common, anyone at all could lay claim to being recorded, and the act of playing back recordings for consumption of their contents makes us all into quasi-expert managers of mediated art. So in sum, the passage from performed poem to poetic recording transfigures not only the object, but the people, institutions, and apparatuses it comes into contact with as it circulates. There's a body of theory that can help us make sense of this process. So maybe um, it's time for just a little theory um, around this, okay? This section of the paper is called A Little Theory. Now, the sense of temporality in this recording is odd. But before we can describe it in a helpful way, it's worth unpacking the theory relevant to this case. Writing about media is not like writing about literature. Uh, even if we're considering a recording of someone reading poems as our primary entity of analysis. One of the through lines in German media theory, from Kittler uh, to Sibyl Kramer to Wolfgang Ernst to Siegert, who I cited earlier, is the idea that analog audio recordings capture not the symbolic content of an utterance, <clears throat> that is, the semantic meaning, but the real, capital R ambient noise, breathing sound, timbre, all the other things that fall away from the written semantic signifier. This already creates a major challenge for literary scholars since we by and large concern ourselves with the study of signs. It poses a challenge because semiotics largely fails as a tool for describing technological procedures. In her writing on Kittler's notion of time criticality, Kramer makes the full extent of the scandal visible. She notes that while writing about media form is not opposed to meaning per se, it still requires developing a writing practice that proceeds through distinctions such as understanding, interpretation, meaning, referent, or representation, all key actions and concepts in literary studies. Uh, so, say, so basically observing that most of those terms, understanding, interpretation, meaning, referent, representation, are not really relevant. The Hare Krishna chant points us directly to this challenge because, to paraphrase Kittler, the poetry here is nothing but the inside of its outside. We can unpack that together after if you want. If we want to be able to address these recordings, we not only have to change our writing practice, we also have to learn to listen differently. The relevant media theory here is Jonathan Stern's work on audile technique uh, or way, you know, methods of listening which he defines as a concrete set of limited and related practices of listening and practical orientations toward listening. And Wolfgang Ernst would add that we also need to take into account the non-human agencies of listening. That is to say, technical devices of observation, measuring, and recording, like you know, the tape machine. The observation that Ernst and other posthumanist theorists of media are making here is that the technological devices we use when we produce, manipulate, and analyze recordings of any sort have been imbued with powerful kinds of agency. They are far from being neutral extensions of our will. As such, we need to acknowledge the analytical work that they do, which in many circumstances may be equal to or greater than the work we do ourselves in recording and calculating. In the most practical terms, how do we listen to this recording? Meaning in part, like with what devices? How would we go about listening to it? Um, and why? What other ways of listening does this listening resemble? And what do we do with the results? After all of that, then we can start thinking about temporality. In his work on the gramophone, Kittler famously argued that analog audio playback literally reproduces the same sound vibrations that were stored on the recording substrate. Playback is thus a kind of, and this is his phrase, time axis manipulation. Wolfgang Ernst extends this contention to digital audio as well, going so far as to state that in a more polemical uh, earlier version of his argument that there's a media archeological sort, short circuit between otherwise historically clear separated lines. So he makes this sort of argument that sound recordings are open up a time portal, basically, between the present and the past because the time axis of that time is actually being replayed. Um, he also goes on to say that we're time sensitive creatures, humans are, right? Uh, you can really notice this if 
have, have any of you ever played vinyl, like records, you know? And if you speed them up, right, you know, uh, if you speed them up, you would notice that the voice sounds strange, right? So imagine you're sitting at a cafe with a friend and suddenly their voice started to speed up if you, as if you were playing, you know, we would be very sensitive to that change, right? And actually, if we listen to a recording and the voice sounds sped up, even if we've never heard that person's voice, we're often able to discern that. Like, so we're very, so we're, t that, that shows our sort of temporal sensitivity in sonic terms, right? Um, and the other thing that we might note is that we're not really equipped to experience two time axes at the same time, right? That we really uh, experience time unfolding in the present, right? But if we somehow um, are encountering time unfolding from another time axis at the same time, it sort of um, jolts us in certain ways. So the, the time portal that Ernst is getting at is really kind of important. He sort of later takes a, you know, takes a step back from the extreme version of this. Um, but so he, so, he, so the, the, this contention to digital audio um, is suggesting that there is a media archaeological short circuit, right, between otherwise historic, historically clearly separated times, like a time portal between the sound event then and our listening to it now. Uh, in later writings, he softens this contention, arguing that audio playback creates a double bind between the historic and the ahistoric sensation between cognitive understanding and affective listening. Thereby, it's possible to experience sonic artifacts from the past both in their difference to the present and as presence. So we can sort of be in the moment with it, but we can also sort of identify that it's not happening in the present. Right? Um, Ernst is quite clear on this point. He says, at any technologically given moment of phonetic reproduction, we're dealing with media, not humans. Um, he says that we're, uh, we are not speaking with the dead, but that an apparatus is operating in an undead mode. From a post-human perspective, the epistemic message here is that the difference between death and life is less significant uh, than we imagine, and machines have more agency than we typically think. For this phonetic reproduction and the presence of the past that it evokes in the present to occur, the recordings must be discoverable and playable. Creating conditions of discoverability for such artifacts falls within the expertise of librarians <clears throat> and archivists and pretty quickly leads us from this portal of transport between the present and the past presence to questions of context for the human agents who were present at the time they created an audible record and who now may or may not be alive in body but remain alive in this kind of afterlife that we're talking about. <clears throat> Some of these deceased poets will only continue to resonate in the present if their recordings can be found and played. Some of the tapes may emit sounds that will help us discover individuals previously unknown to the historical record. It may give them life, in a sense, for the first time uh, to, to certain people. Right? Some of the surviving poets may have information that will help us discover recorded historical happenings and presences that would otherwise have been left unknown. None of them can be discovered or heard without some basic metadata. And the fields of context of which such data about the recordings is comprised. So the relevant theory suggests that what we want to know about the Ginsberg tape will not be apparent if we use conventional methods of literary analysis. So among the methods that uh, I like to use when thinking about objects like this tape are oral literary history. We do a lot of oral histories around these things to try to understand uh, context of the event and what that actually meant while it was happening archival research where we're thinking about these materials in relation to other archival entities to help situate them and contextualize them. And what uh, uh, material media forensics. Um, and I'll just very briefly talk about them. I don't have time to go into them in any detail, but oral history is because when you speak to surviving participants and attendees of the documented events, you begin to understand the sources and the social and symbolic significance of the signals in a recording archival research, not only because it allows one to connect the discrete event to multiple other events that contain implicated creators and contributors found in other fonds, but from a meta perspective, because it reveals an archival multiverse reading of a poetry reading series by recognizing the plurality of personal and institutional record creators and keepers who manage and preserve the legacy of 20th century poetic practice and performance 
In other words, it makes us aware of how important archival structures are for um, the concepts that we apply to such texts or artifacts. Uh, it invites reflection on the archival and institutional record structures that give shape to the present, in the present to the afterlife of performance. And material media forensics, which may be the least familiar of these, um, is important because a close examination of the material media object can sometimes tell us some very interesting things about the nature of the event uh, or the nature of our desire to know the nature of the event. This method usually requires a combination of physical examination of the material artifact combined with forensic attention to the digitized signal from the artifact so that one can piece together in retrospect <clears throat> to, uh, to what extent the actions made on the tape, for example, before and after the event have given form to our playable documentary record of it. <clears throat> Are there discernible splices, uh, pauses that interrupt the signal? Those sorts of questions open up significant reflection on the relationship between event and entity, between what happened, our current time-based media account of what happened, and our desire to know and create a coherent narrative about what happened. The critical result of these methods is not anything like a close reading or interpretation. Rather, what it provides is a contextual material discursive analysis of the relative position and importance of the tape and the sounds it holds for any interested scholars. So I don't have time, like I said, to go into each of these methods in any detail, but I'm, I'm happy to give examples, um, specific examples in discussion if we have time for that. Um, I'm going to race ahead now towards some polemical conclusions um, or statements of conclusion based on what I've been showing and, and This is more or less what I've covered so far, and, uh, and we're at the polemical conclusion stage, so we're getting near the end of the talk. So polemical point number one concerns the status of the entity, our object of study, in relation to formal disciplines of knowledge. Okay. Most of what is important to literary scholars about the ongoing circulation of the Ginsburg recording and the other spoken web recordings uh, is incidental to their content. Where conventional literary methodology deals primarily with the interpretation of symbolic content, understanding media objects, even those with literary content, requires attentions to factors that hermeneutic methods can't address because those factors are external to the object. Materiality, the circulation and transfiguration of objects and forms, the role of institutions and their archives, the role of interpretive communities, the use of cultural techniques like recording and editing reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, the collection and cataloging protocols, etc. Point number two concerns the perspectives historians consult on memory of the meaning of an event. We need to understand institutional histories, as I've been suggesting sort of at length in this talk, but we also need to think about them as much from the unofficial accounts of people who were there, not just artists, the poets and organizers, the expert professors, but audience members, students, media technicians, recordists, uh, these other sort of supposedly peripheral agents, right? Uh, so we need to hear from them as much as we do from the official institutional narratives. Um, that's why oral history and engagement with a broad spectrum of voices on the memory of events and what they might have meant is important. Point number three concerns materiality. Material media substrates like AV equipment also matter because they, par they are part of the infrastructure that enables cultural events like poetry readings to occur. Then as now, uh, and we experience all kinds of you know, issues with the media substrate here, right? Uh, but still, I'm able to do mostly what I wanted to do. Um, material media substrates, uh, so, so then as now, one of the rationales for an institutional investment in media technology is to bolster the reputation of the university on a national level. The content of the recordings themselves if we're being honest, is often an afterthought, at least during certain phases of collections development. So, you know, these tapes, these recordings were made over a decade. They sat completely unused for 45 to 50 years, right? Um, but they justified uh, the investment in technology at that period of the institution's existence. Point number four concerns method and the status of content. And I've been belaboring this point, but I'll just say it one more time. As our processing of a collection matures, we may find ourselves more concerned with questions of methodology. How do I go about listening to the qualities of this particular recording, either by listening closely 
to it on its own or listening to it in relation to a large set of other recordings. Content in this sense is the focus, but not one of interpreting content in terms of its thematics, imagery, or tropes, right? So we don't listen to a, a recording of Ginsburg singing Blake's The Lamb, right? One of his songs been with the aim of unpacking the imagery of innocence. That's not how we approach that particular kind of audio text. We listen and wonder what exactly this performance might have meant while it was happening. We listen wondering what the heck he was doing, right? Uh, what, uh, what that doing meant at the time. Uh, what we mean by content thus changes when discussing this kind of uh, artifact. Point number five concerns the cultural function of poetry recordings in the analog past and in the current scholarly, in current scholarly contexts. Tapes of poetry serve ritual functions as much as they do documentary functions. They existed as a kind of sacred object, circulated from one generation of writers to the next until the moment for digitization appeared as a function of porting research funding models from hard sciences to the humanities. So with this new influx of funding, humanities projects needed to scale up and they needed new implicitly technical objects of study and projects that produced data. In many cases, old analog recordings became the occasion for digitization and the production of scores of digital archives with little regard at first to the sustainability or use of these archives. The creation of reams of new digital objects also required the creation of protocols for identifying, sorting, and searching them. Assigning metadata to objects is about investing them with value in terms of institutional commodities infrastructures. What kind of metadata an entity is assigned and how thorough the cataloging of that entity reflects a bolstering of the institutional metadata network as well as that object's value. The circulation of scholars across provincial and national boundaries to participate in research activities like those surrounding our research on this tape over quite a few years is also a ritual that functions the contemporary bureaucratic imperatives of research communication and quote unquote impact. What we do at conferences and other scholarly events is help to consolidate and maintain cultural power at various levels, departmental, faculty, discipline, university, municipality, province, nation, etc. So one pressing question is whether or not we can invigorate well-established research rituals with the new perspectives, tools, and methods we've been describing in order to transform our institutions in progressive and durable ways even as various internal and external forces compete to quantize and monetize every aspect of academic practice. So my consideration of the afterlife of performance and the numerous cultural techniques surrounding its material trace, a tape recording, has aimed to highlight some of the methods that are in play as we might prepare answers to this last pressing question. Thanks very much. And I realized I wasn't keeping track of time at all, so. I, <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Really interesting, really rich talk. That brings together so many things. The misreality aspect, right? Events of things that are affected, as opposed to the written page. Uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about how, like, as literary scholars, we look at the page that is kind of absent of affect, and then this brings it back in a sense, right? So it's a communal kind of thing. Yeah. But there's lots of interesting uh, questions around that. Historicity of the just so much. So, I'll check it. Oh, wait, wait. <rire> euh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez aussi? Ah oui, mais est-ce que ça serait préférable? Merci beaucoup euh, pour la belle conférence. Euh, C'est des questions très, très naïves. Euh, vous présentiez la plateforme euh, Spoken Web au début. Est-ce qu'il y a un espace où euh, le public peut ajouter des commentaires de précision sur les descriptions que vous listez sur des chansons, par exemple? Je voyais que... Il y avait une inscription euh, « maybe indie »,« maybe in, indie 
Euh, on n'était pas sûr de la langue. Euh, je pense à des chercheurs qui peuvent consulter cette base de données-là, puis euh, peut-être vouloir apporter des précisions. Donc, est-ce que euh, quand vous avez, je ne sais pas à quel point vous avez euh, participé à la, au design de la base de données, mais avez-vous pensé, avez pensé à ajouter ce genre de, de clause-là, là, de partie que les, les gens peuvent euh, commenter pour ajouter des précisions? Oui, merci pour la question. C'est un peu, est-ce qu'on peut crowdsourcing, euh, oui, les, les commentaires sur les, les enregistrements. Euh, pour le moment, euh, il y a un courriel et je, re, je, je reçois des courriels euh, beaucoup, oui, euh, avec des petites corrections. Si, si quelqu'un trouve euh, un enregistrement, il voit même euh, un mot est incorrect ou un nom est incorrect. Parce qu'on ne sait pas tout, on, en, on, on écoute. C'était les étudiants euh, qui ont fait les transcriptions normalement et euh, il y a des erreurs. Et pour le moment, c'est vraiment juste euh, comme ça qu'on reçoit les corrections. Mais on est en train de euh, développer le front-end pour euh, tout, toutes les collections. Et euh, on, on parle beaucoup de ça. S'il y a peut-être un, un autre... Euh, éléments dans le, dans le GUI qu'on peut ajouter pour que les gens puissent euh, ajouter les corrections juste là, comme ça, euh, les suggestions, même, même pas seulement les suggestions, mais les, des, des corrections, mais aussi des interprétations ou des observations pour, pour partager avec les autres. Un espace où on peut avoir une, une conversation en ligne sur les enregistrements. Alors, j'espère qu'on qu peut, peut le faire, peut l'ajouter euh, pour le front-end de toutes les collections, mais on verra parce que c'est très compliqué de, de créer le front-end pour euh, tel, euh, on, on, a, on a 50 collections, euh, c'est des centaines d'heures d'audio, de, de alors euh, euh, ce n'est pas une priorité, mais on, alors on a le courriel, mais si on peut, on va ajouter ça, ouais. Merci beaucoup. Ouais. C'est vrai que c'est dans les finitions des fois, là, dans des projets de base de données, c'est les choses auquel on pense après coup. Donc, euh, ouais, ça. si je peux peut-être abuser puis euh, poser une deuxième question, <rire> c'est un peu dans, le même, euh, dans la même lignée, mais euh, je ne sais pas si vous avez croisé des cas euh, dans, les, euh, dans les tapes, dans les cassettes euh, ou euh, dans les bobines que vous écoutiez, s'il y a des enregistrements qui traduisent aussi les commentaires du public. Euh, J'ai euh, un cas en tête euh, quand j'avais travaillé sur des poètes de la contre-culture euh, Gassien Lapointe, par exemple à Trois-Rivières. Mm -hmm. euh, on entendait beaucoup le public euh, commenter. Euh, euh, puis euh, je me demandais si c'était un cas que vous avez croisé. Puis si oui, est-ce que vous traduisez, est-ce que vous répercutez les commentaires sur, encore une fois, la base de données? Oui, c'est une très bonne question. Oui, alors... Euh ça, c'est une collection, c'est le Sir George Williams Poetry Series. C'était très, le format était très euh, normatif. Alors, il y avait le, euh, une introduction, le poète, euh, normalement le poète, c'est le poète qui parle. On, on a, entend le, euh, les gens dans, qui, qui étaient là, mais sûrement euh, you know, ça. Et, il n'y avait pas une Q&A des questions après. Mais euh, on a beaucoup d'autres collections où on entend les gens qui étaient dans, dans la chambre qui, qui parlent. Um, il y a, ça dépend à uh, plusieurs choses si on, si on, on le met en ligne comme ça. Um, Peut-être que je vais, je vais changer en anglais pour être assez précise, mais so, there are a, a few considerations. One is resources, right? Si on a une collection avec uh, une centaine d'enregistrements, on ne va pas faire des transcriptions on va perdre des petites descriptions de content. Like, so it basically, you know, it can't be full transcription, so those wouldn't have it. Um, but then there are also ethical questions, right? Um, so our, you know, we, we, we I, I was talking about the legal situation where the recordist has the rights, right, to the recording, but we're dealing with communities uh, that we're very close with, we're very implicated with, And so all, all of our collections, um, before we put them online, we actually reach out and ask for consent and permission to do so. And, um, and for those 
voices, often they're anonymous, we don't know who they are, so there are ethical considerations as to whether we would put those up or not. And so there are, and, and those considerations are often treated on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the collection, on the person managing the collection, uh, their uh, relationship to the communities that they've been reaching out to, to include them. Um, so if there are the resources, we would transcribe everything, except for the poems. You might have noticed that the poems, because we don't have the rights to the printed poem, right? So we could play the poem, but we don't have, we, the publishers have the rights to the printed poem, so we can't reproduce the text of the poems themselves, right? Um, but we can re reproduce all of the extra poetic speech, right? Including those of the audience. Um, if we had the resources, we would transcribe them, but then we would ask ourselves ethically, it, you know, is this something that would be okay to actually make public, right? Because if we don't know who that person is or et cetera. So it would be very deeply considered, you know, we're overcautious and, uh, and sensitive and caring in a way to, um, to the potential impact of, of making these things public. But it's a great question. And there, I mean, I've been talking mostly about recordings of events, but we have full collections of recordings of conversations. You sh we should remember that like in the 60s, a lot of people had reel-to-reel -reel tape machines and they used them for different things, you know. So Warren Tallman, who was a professor at, at um, uh, UBC in the 60s and brought all the New York School poets and, and Ginsburg and Olson and all these American poets to Canada for the first time, really, uh, and sort of brought a certain avant-garde to Canada from the States. Um, would hold all these soirees like at home and have his tape machine running the whole time. And we have many, many hours of just conversations, right, that students are transcribing and working on, but there are big questions about whether those recordings should be made public at all. They weren't, you know, they weren't public events even, right, you know. So the, the kind of question you asked um, about a public event and someone speaking from the audience would apply even more uh, to uh, like these other kinds of recordings, you know, yeah. Thanks once again for your really fascinating talk. I'm really interested in this idea of the materiality of the objects that you have. You said at one point they're sacred objects, right? And then you also evoke Benjamin's idea of art in the, in the era of mechanical reproduction. The original has this kind of aura around it, right? So even seeing the images of like the, those old fashioned tapes and so on, there's a kind of fetishization of this material. Um, how does that play into the research? And also what happens when we no longer need that material? In the digital age, everything goes live stream, everything, not everything is dematerialized. So how, how, do, how, do you, how does that play into this idea of of recording and this idea of like, I was thinking given of it, when you go to see a movie that's on 16 millimeter film, mm -hmm. all those pops and crackles, there's a certain kind of joy around them. There's a certain kind of pleasure around seeing that because it's this antique or not antique or at least dated, a dated materiality. Um, so how do you, how do you see that, the, the kind of link between the materiality of the thing and the study of this material once we no longer need the material? It's a weird question, but. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. It's one that I've thought about a lot. And I'll get to the ritual observation in a second, because it's very true that in many ways, these tapes have functioned as these um, ritual sacred artifacts that are passed on from one generation to the next. Um, my colleague, Darren Wurschler, uh, I don't know, I think, I think it's in Pulp Fiction or one of the films where uh, Christopher Walken uh, has this gold watch that his father, you know, basically kept up inside him uh, when he was a prisoner of war. And then, he, you know, he, he takes that watch and he passes it on to his son. And so Darren always says, like, these tapes are sort of like that watch, you know, like essentially one generation <laughs> made these tapes and they're looking for who in the next generation will actually take them on and and it's partly like a form of self-preservation. And, you know, like, you know, so that's the, I, I said I was going to come to that, but that is part of the sacred element of these artifacts, you know, that they're, the artifacts themselves are uh, overdetermined, uh, in, in, invested with this sort of sense of um, uh, 
trying to maintain a presence of a kind of past literary formation uh, into the future, you know. And so the artifacts, the fact that like, oh, we have this tape that Fred Waugh made and held up the microphone for when Ginsburg was reading, like there's something, you know, to which very few people, but there are a few people who would make a pilgrimage to see it, you know, like because it has this kind of sacred function. But I think more importantly, um, from my perspective, just from uh, a kind of critical perspective, I'm very interested in the relationship between media history and literary history, right? And one of the ways of thinking about that, and I find is very important, is actually thinking about the relationship between media formats and the affordances of media formats, different media formats, and literary forms. And um, in a sense, the way these media uh, technologies and the formats uh, informed uh, the kinds of uh, literary recordings that could be made. So let me give you a very quick example of this. Um, the earliest sound recordings were recorded on wax cylinders, as you may know, and they held about three to four minutes of sound, right? So that was the, that was the maximum amount of sound. And because they were acoustic, there was no, they weren't electrically made. In order to make a recording, you would literally be vibrating, yeah, trying to have air pressure make a diaphragm vibrate, which would have a stylus move enough to inscribe a signal onto a wax cylinder. So there's no electronic mic that is transducing air currents into electrical signals back into air currents, right? Which uh, allows you to amplify that sound and, and get a more subtle, refined recording, right? Uh, acoustic sound recording, you were bellowing into a horn, basically. So it informed both the ways you could perform a poem. So if you listen to the earliest sound recordings of poetry, they sound embarrassing to us because they're very dramatic and loud and there's tons of vibrato and, and they're not how we would read poems now because, you know, and, and you could say in part, it's a result of the affordances of the technology that actually informed the transmission and performance of literature at that period, at least as how, how we're receiving it through these media artifacts. Tape is a fascinating medium to think about in relation to affordances. It's the first time that we could record a full reading that would last many hours because tape recording media technologies could be, uh, most tape machines could uh, record and play back at different speeds. Uh, very slow speeds to make your tape last longer, or faster speeds to have better sound quality. And because poetry readings are just a single voice and you don't need great sound fidelity because it's not a complicated frequency signal, right? It's human voice is, comes within a certain signal frequency range. You could record them at very slow speeds and have a three hour recording, you know, two and a half hour recording. Um, so. Tape, so tape is a, a fascinating medium to think about like, oh, it suddenly allows us to encounter and consider a full length reading as a kind of entity unto itself for analysis, right? Uh, and also a lot of poets were using tape in different ways um, to create art. Jackson McClough, for example, would do a live reading, record it with a tape machine, and then go to the next venue, have a tape machine playing the last reading while he was reading live but then have another one recording it and compound this over and over again so that by the time he got to his seventh venue, he'd have like seven machines, you know. And so what was he doing? He was capturing the time and place and audience, the voices of the people in the crowd from these other spaces, right, which may have had very different um, politics, may have had very, you know, those contexts. He was bringing other contexts into the present context, right. So the medium itself, the affordances of the medium allowed him to do that, right. So thinking about media formats and their affordances in relation to uh, audio textual forms, I think is an important critical uh, way of, in, of, of thinking about materiality. And then I guess the third thing I'd say is I was talking about media forensics, right? Um, let's see if I can, no, uh, I, I don't have a, an example here, but those leader tape, um, you know, the slide with the tape with those splices, right? This one. Um, you can look at this tape, right, and look at those splices and see where they come, and they represent cuts in the tape. So, so essentially we have the, if we think of the event as the thing that happened in time, and then we have the media artifact, uh, which is a trace of that event, right, uh, and there are visible gaps, right, uh, in time, and those represent places where we might need to supplement our knowledge of what happened during that span of time through oral histories, for example. So, 
um, the first splice in this tape between the chanting, the Hare Krishna chanting, and the beginning of the reading were, uh, prompted for me an oral history interview with George Bowering asking, like, you know, how long did the chanting actually go for, you know? And so he told me this long story where before every poetry event, we go to this Chinese restaurant, I took Allen Ginsberg to the Chinese restaurant. Um, we were there uh, at 7.30. Um, and uh, just as this giant fish arrived on the table for us to eat, it was 8 p.m. And Alan said, I promised the Hare Krishnas I would go chanting with them um, and, uh, before the reading. So Alan Ginsberg had been chanting with the Hare Krishnas for an hour prior to the reading, which began at 9 p.m. And then George Baring said, they chanted for another 45 minutes, right, before the reading actually began. So the reading started around 10 p.m. Um, on this tape, we have 15 minutes of chanting, and we have no idea what was happening, right? So, from a, the, so the media artifact can be useful as um, if you analyze it, right, uh, to actually um, point to places where you would need to supplement, you know, the contextual narrative, um, et cetera. So once they're digitized, there are, there are also traces of the media artifact that you can find on the digital digitized record. Like, so on this tape, actually, there are leader tape cuts. So there are like sudden cuts, but there are also pauses. Um, so there are stops in the audio where you don't have leader tape, but they were just, and you can't see that on the, on the, um, uh, on the reel to reel tape, but you can actually notice it on the digitized version because you can hear them and you can actually see them, whoops, sorry, you can see them on the waveform, right? So moving across, that's why I was saying when you do media, sort of this kind of media archeological or forensic analysis, it's often a combination of, you know, the material and the digital that allows you to sort of try to analyze the signal for essentially context, you know? Um, yeah, and so usually when we digitize them and we preserve them, these tapes aren't played again, you know? Um, they're kept in the archives though, and there are a lot of things on the tape boxes and, and stuff that are of interest because they provide information, contextual information for the event that the signal is a uh, trace of, right? Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully they don't get thrown out. Usually, you know, these are the things that when, you, when we make deposits, they want the tapes and they want to keep them, and it's sort of like a sign of the thing that's behind the digital files, but they're being digitally preserved now. Uh, so the long-term existence of the contents of these tapes exists in digital media only, not on, on material. In fact, uh, I have, so I have a, a lab at Concordia where we do a lot of digitization, and one of the pieces of equipment that I had to purchase for my lab was um, a scientific oven, right? Um, which, which, uh, which, it's an oven that, that works at very low temperatures, but maintains the temperature very consistently for very long periods of time. So you can set it for like 20 hours and it'll emit the exact same amount of heat for that length of time. And the reason I use it, like scientists use it for different purposes to treat chemicals or other, other biological samples. Um, but, and in a way, these are chemical and biological samples that we're treating on these tapes is um, in order to, stabilize this medium before digitizing it, right? Um, we need to dry it out. And so we actually bake our tapes before we digitize them, right? Um, and that it, uh, it eliminates the, any humidity that may be in them that would lead to sticky shed syndrome, that problem that I was mentioning. Um, but then once you bake them, uh, it stabilizes them for about a week and then it actually compromises them even more. Uh, so you need to digitize them in that period uh, and the tape becomes even more sort of sensitive, uh, fragile after going through this process. So to a certain extent, we're destroying the material artifact through this digital preservation process. Uh, so yeah, the relationship between the different media formats is pretty fascinating to think about. Yeah. Other questions? Have maybe, we are going around, uh, over time, but I have a very quick question. Um, the relative rarity of this kind of material as opposed to, like today, everything gets recorded. Mm -hmm. It's just like people, like Twitter, YouTube, yeah. all that stuff, it's just constant, right? Is it, in your estimation, more difficult now to do this kind of archival research because, like, you know what I mean? Like you're in a sea of recording. Yeah, it's a great question. What how do you pick out the stuff that's relevantly important in terms of literature, in terms of 
culture, in terms of community and so on, when absolutely everything gets recorded? I mean, it's, it's a, kind of a tricky... Yeah, no, I think it's such a great question. I mean, in a way, that's what my whole talk was about, right? Is that um, part of what's manifest in the work being done on these materials is the production of literary value, right? The more, the more time you spend on creating metadata for something, describing it, right? Contextualizing it, making it accessible, uh, preserving it. This costs a lot of money, right? And it also takes a lot of time. Um, and it's basically making these things, giving them or suggesting that they have value, right? Uh, now we're in a born digital sort of environment and um, the, the main thing, I mean, in, in many ways it's wonderful because there are materials all over uh, available. But at the same time, it's very ephemeral because there's no, there are no metadata structures that are organizing them in a manner that would uh, allow us to sort of uh, think about them in an organized way that would sort of uh, instantiate their value, right, um, in a, you know, from a literary perspective. Uh, I worked, I was telling you briefly, but I worked on this project over the last couple of years, um, which is essentially collecting data about every literary event that happened in Canada during the pandemic, right? I was very interested in what happened to literary events um, from March 2020 to March 2022 because so much had to move online. Um, and essentially we were collecting data about these events from social media because most of these events now essentially are advertising themselves in that milieu, right? Um, and when I think about the result of that project uh, and we're not, we didn't, pull the recordings, but we will point to the recordings if they've been made available somewhere on Facebook Live or YouTube or whatever, right, you know. Um, and what we've done in a way, when I think about this project, what we've done is we've created a data structure, right, that has um, preserved certain amounts of information about all of these events, right, um, that has made them um, studyable, you know, uh, in ways that they wouldn't have been otherwise, and which could give certain of those events, you know, much more value than they would have. So I suppose one of the arguments of my paper is that context, right, is what produces the literary, right, uh, and um, the, the complexity of this pr proliferation of digital manifestations of recordings, right, you know, of events, um, is, is wonderful to have them produce, but they're only really, you know, going to be contributing to um, literary research and sort of the, at least from, from the perspective of literary studies, you know, studies that actually theorize them, think about them, um, uh, grant a sense of, of significance to them, you know, if they're to a certain extent, you know, organized, uh, uh, named, and legitimated through metadata structures, you know. Uh, so we have tons of stuff, and the big challenge really is um, how do you how do you organize that? So I, we do consulting for um, reading series where they are recording their events, um, but they don't know what to do with their MP3s after, right? You know, like they have them on a hard drive, and eventually those will decay too, because digital decay is a real thing as well, right? Um, so there are certain management practices, again, we come back to management, that would, um, in a sense, allow those things to persist in a way that could make them usable for research study, and perhaps then allow them to accrue literary value as a result. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think we'll end there. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks so much. Time. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps we'll have a shortened uh, lunch break. Oh, sorry about that. No, no, I it's, it's perfectly fine. We started late anyway, and an interesting conversation after. So we'll come back maybe in 35, 40 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay, great. And there's lunch here on the table. Enjoy. <laughs>